Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining. So looking forward to this discussion, pushing innovation in acute myeloid leukemia, real-world integration of modern therapeutics into personalized patient management. So this is our panel. We have Dr. Uma Barade, Dr. Harry Erba, and Dr. Amir Fati, along with myself. Okay, so I'm going to just start with a very brief intro, and then we'll kind of go into the more detailed sections and, and discussions. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen many versions of similar slide, just showing the excitement and the progress that's happening in acute myeloid leukemia. Nine, ten potentially drugs approved now. Quizartinib, we're hoping to hear very soon in the near future, and hopefully get it approved in the frontline space based on the quantum first, but the other nine already are fully approved. So this is great. The landscape is changing. The outcomes are improving, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and we're going to talk about, you know, some of those strategies going forward and just kind of, you know, showing that even today, we're still seeing that intensive chemotherapy is commonly used. And that is reasonable if the patient is fit and healthy for intensive chemo. I think the bigger issue is still the use of single agent HMA. And I've been in many discussions with many of you where I kind of find this still striking that close to one third of patients are still getting single agent HMA, even though HMA event has shown such uh, clear efficacy and activity. And maybe that's something we will talk about as we get into it, because I think at least in our experience, we're not really using single agent HMA for our AML patients. If they are able to receive therapy, it's usually HMA, venetoclax-based treatments. The other thing, of course, is that a lot of what you see published and presented at the big meetings, ASCO, ASH, EHA, of course, have a lot of focused team data, is from big academic centers. And we are now seeing that the gap between what's happening in the big academic centers and in smaller community is actually getting wider and wider. The more drugs are available, the more the need for molecular integration of treatment that creates, of course, good outcomes for the patients, but also creates hurdles if you don't have those tests available quickly or are not able to integrate that data. So we're still seeing that the testing for molecular is still not ubiquitous, close to 40% patients in this analysis that was done a few years ago. And I'm hoping that it will be better in the last five years, especially with more IDH inhibitors and a second FLT3 inhibitor and maybe menin inhibitors all coming. But still, there is work to be done. NGS is not a given. I get a lot of patients in my clinic today who either don't have the results or the test was sent and it's still taking three weeks, very commonly in many community settings. So I think this will have to change if we're going to really integrate great frontline molecular treatments, which is the hope in the next five to 10 years. So the goals for tonight are to review the kind of baseline prognostic factors and prognostic markers, treatment selection in acute myeloid leukemia. Of course, go more into targeted and personalized treatment approaches in different acute myeloid leukemia populations, and then also to integrate newer treatment options into management of acute myeloid leukemia, and then also talk about toxicities, safeties. Each of these drugs has unique monitoring and safety parameters that I think are also very important to discuss and integrate as these very rapidly get pushed out from the clinical trials into the routine real world use. We'd like to thank the Health Tree Foundation for Acute Myeloid Leukemia. This is a body that is doing great work empowering AML patients focused on patient education and navigation and also developing programs that can help create the patients to the appropriate clinical trials, academic centers, if they don't have any other standards or if they want to seek opinions, which I think in AML is really, really good given how rapidly the field is moving and new drugs and trials are becoming available that may not yet have pervaded into the common knowledge in the community. And also they're working to to develop real-world data portals that could be used in the future for data mining and assessment of outcomes. So I think this is a really great initiative. You can look at the details there at healthtree.org. And I think for our patients who often get slammed very quickly with a lot of information, I'm hoping this will be able to give them high-quality evidence-based data to help navigate some of the initial stages of AML, which can be quite overwhelming and difficult for a new patient. So we're going to move here towards split three, the biggest mutational group, 30 to 35 percent of patients, and a lot happening there among all the molecular groups. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Erba to get our knowledge bars to the right side. Thanks, Novel. So um, the patient, we'll call her Susan, a 50-year-old woman with confirmed FLT3 ITD mutated AML. She presents with fatigue, with headaches, with blurred vision actually, and dyspnea, and with an oxygen requirement. She has a performance status of one and only has a comorbidity of hypothyroidism. When she presents, she has a white count of 347,000 predominantly myeloid blasts with a hemoglobin of 4.5, platelets of 39,000. 
we actually don't do a bone marrow biopsy on her. The peripheral blood flow shows myeloid blasts. The peripheral blood cytogenetics demonstrates trisomy 8. The peripheral blood PCR, which we do because we get that data back quickly within 72 hours, shows FLT3 ITD, actually two internal tandem duplications with an allelic ratio of 1.7. And when we get the NGS panel back a couple of weeks later, she also has the DNA methyltransferase 3A and NRAS mutations. So the question I want to address is, what are we going to do for an, a fit, young patient with FLT3 mutated acute myeloid leukemia as new FLT3 inhibitors come into commercial availability? So let's first summarize what we know about FLT3 mutations. First of all, remember, FLT3 is a receptor tyrosine kinase that is critical to myeloid development. It is there for a reason. It binds the FLT3 ligand, it dimerizes, and then sets in, cas in motion a cascade of events that lead to promotion of survival and proliferation of bone marrow progenitors. FLT3 mutations are among the three most commonly mutated genes in AML with DNA methyltransferase 3, 3A and nucleophosmin 1. 25% of AMLs will have an internal tandem duplication that leads to loss of an inhibitory signal and has been associated with a poor prognosis, mostly due to an increased risk of relapse. About 5 to 10% of AML patients will have a FLT3 TKD mutation. However, the impact of the TKD mutation is less clear. For example, in this data from a German registry, where they looked at the impact of a single gene mutation on overall survival, you could see that FLT3 TKD was actually associated with a more favorable outcome than the FLT3 ITD, which was generally below that and associated with a less favorable outcome. And the, and the reason for this is possibly related to the fact that the FLT3 TKD mutation is often associated with other mutations that are generally associated with a better prognosis, such as NPM1 and the core binding factor leukemias. The RATIFY trial was performed and has changed the standard of care as currently available in the United States and most of the world for patients with FLT3 mutated acute myeloid leukemia. Now, what you need to remember about this study is that it accrued patients with both FLT3 ITD and TKD mutated disease up to uh, but less than the age of 60 adults. And in this study, mitostorum was included or a placebo for two weeks post-induction with seven and three, post-consolidation with hydrocytarabine, and then one year of maintenance. And this primary endpoint was survival. It was met by mitostorum. There's a dramatic difference in median survivals based on where these curves are plateauing. I think a more reasonable view of the benefit if, is when you look at the four-year survival, 51% with mitostorum versus 44% with placebo. And again, remember, this includes both FLT3 ITD and TKD mutated patients. Now, the standard of care for patients with FLT3 ITD mutated AML has actually evolved over the last decade, and we have come to realize that allogeneic stem cell transplantation is very important for these patients. And so what my colleague uh, Rich Stone and the RATIFY investigators looked at was the outcomes of patients in this trial, whether they got a transplant in first remission or not. And as you can see, there is a clear benefit of mitostorin in the patients who underwent allogeneic stem cell transplant in first remission. However, if they received an allogeneic transplant at any time outside of first remission, so after relapse, did not get a transplant in first remission, there was no difference in overall survival. So the question that is in front of us is, can we do better than mitostorin? After all, mitostorin is a first-generation FLT3 inhibitor, which means it was selected because it had activity against FLT3, but it also has activity against many other kinases, both tyrosine kinases and serine threonine kinases. Second-generation drugs have been developed that are more potent and more specific for FLT3 not purely specific, but more specific. There are also two types of inhibitors here. Type 1 inhibitors, such as mitostorin and gilteritinib and cronolinib, they will inhibit both TKD and ITD FLT3 mutations. A type 2 inhibitor, such as quizartinib or serafinib, the first-generation drug, will only inhibit the FLT3 ITD because when a TKD mutation occurs, the FLT3 molecule folds into the active conformation and cannot bind those type 2 inhibitors. So the question is, can we do better than mitostorin? Here I'm showing you the results of the quantum first study, and this is the design of quizartinib, a second-generation type 2 inhibitor with 
7 and 3 chemotherapy versus 7 and 3 alone in FLT3 ITD mutated AML patients up to the age of 75. So there are a number of differences here that are really important to take into account when looking at this data compared to Ratify. It included only the poor risk ITD patients, included patients who were over the age of 60. And in fact, 40% of the patients in this clinical trial were over the age of 60 in our study. The patients had to be newly diagnosed, of course, and they could begin 7 and 3 chemotherapy as soon as the diagnosis of AML was made and before they were actually registered and randomized the trial while you're waiting for the FLT3 mutation. Very important when you consider how proliferative the disease in these patients can be. The primary endpoint was overall survival. The other difference between these studies is that quizartinib was continued as a maintenance versus placebo after transplant and was continued versus placebo as a maintenance for for up to three years. And here again, the primary endpoint of this study was reached with an improvement in the overall survival. Quizartinib median survival 32 months versus placebo 15 months for a hazard ratio of 0.776. Now, if you just look at this data alone and think about what you just saw with the Ratify trial that also had a hazard ratio of 0.78, you're going to say, there's no difference here. But these are very different populations of patients, and we need to take that into account for Susan's sake, because that's who we're treating here. We're treating somebody who we are treating for leukemia with curative intent. And so I think it is important to look at the subsets in this clinical trial with quizartinib. You might argue, why was the study done like this at all? Well, the first important point is that this study started in 2016 before mitosterin was even available in the United States. And the Senior Science Council that I read, led with Richard Schlenk in Germany decided that we would not amend the study after the availability of mitosterin, partly because it was only available in the U.S. and took time to be available in other parts of the world. So that's why the control arm has placebo here. But remember, mitostorin has almost no single agent activity in AML. Almost no CRs were seen in the initial studies with single agent mitostorin. What's important to look at here is the cumulative incidence of relapse in the ratified trial on the left and the quantum first trial on the right. The cumulative incidence of relapse at two years was just over 40% with mitostorin in the ratified trial. And remember, that's including only younger patients, also with a TKD mutation, compared to 31% at two years with quizartinib in the quantum first study. Now, why might this be? We, all, we saw other evidence of improved outcomes in terms of duration of remission and relapse-free survival. But what is the underpinnings of this benefit of quizartinib in addition to chemotherapy? And for the first time, we were able to show in a prospective trial that regardless of therapy, if the patient achieved an MRD negative remission, in this case using a very sensitive FLT3 MRD assay done by NGS, that there was a better survival in patients who were MRD negative. That that's shown on the left. What you're looking at on the right is the plot of the FLT3 ITD allelic ratio using this MRD assay in all patients with quizartinib versus placebo. And there are two points here. There was a greater percentage of patients in complete remission with undetectable MRD with quizartinib than with placebo, 14% versus 7%. And the median FLT3 ITD allelic ratio was lower with quizartinib, 0.01% versus 0.03%. Now, you know, we all have eyes. We can all see these dots. And you're looking at this and you're thinking, this does not look very different between the two. But keep in mind the importance of this. This is after just giving two weeks of quizartinib. And very few patients go on to transplant after that induction. They get consolidation, they get maintenance. And so we're looking forward to more MRD data from the study. But what's important to me as a treating physician is I really think Susan needs to undergo allogeneic stem cell transplant in first remission. Unfortunately, a lot of things can happen to Susan that might preclude her from undergoing stem cell transplant in first remission. Now, we know most people will have a donor, but will she have a caregiver? Will she run into some kind of toxicity that keeps her from being a candidate for allogeneic transplant? Or will she just say, transplant is not in my cards? So for me as a clinician, I want to know if the patient gets into a 
remission. What is their outcome if they got quizartinib or placebo with or without getting the transplant? And here you see that analysis. It's the post hoc analysis of the quantum first study that I asked the statisticians to give me. And this shows on the left the patients who did get a transplant. But what's remarkable to me is in the patients who did not get a transplant in first remission, there is a clear benefit of quizartinib in those patients who achieve remission with a hazard ratio of 0.6. However, we have to keep the whole story in mind because this study did include patients up to the age of 75, and it was an international clinical trial. And think about what was happening because the accrual of this patient, I told you about the beginning, 2016, we didn't have mitostorin. The end of the accrual in the world was in 2019, April 2019, which many of you may remember as being six months after the accelerated approval in the United States of ASA with venetoclax, HMAs or LODAC with venetoclax. So we finally had an option for patients with AML that may benefit from a less intensive therapy. Now, we'll talk probably probably during our discussion about the benefits of those less intensive therapies in older patients. But the point of this is that when a physician in these countries saw a patient who was over the age of 60, they had to make a decision whether that patient was going to get palliative care and basically have a very short survival or take a chance on intensive chemotherapy and put them on this study. And so looking at the data in that way, look at the left-hand side. The hazard ratio here is 0.6 nine, much lower than what was seen in the RATIFY trial in patients 59 and younger. And again, this is just the ITD mutated patients, but we didn't see we did not see an improvement in survival. In fact, we have to be concerned because if you look at the left-hand part of those curves, the mitostorin arm has a worse survival early on. And it makes you wonder if were there some things that we could have done or recognized in those patients in terms of supportive care, growth factors, that, or just selection of patients that may have impacted on that early mortality because there was actually a trend for an improvement in median survival even in the older patients. And the hazard ratio there was 0.9 in favor of quizartinib. So getting back to the toxicities, spoken as a true leukemia doctor, when combining a third drug, quizartinib, with intensive chemotherapy and its continuation, we found this to be manageable. We're leukemia doctors. We find a lot to be manageable. Ask our patients what they find to be manageable. That might be a little bit different. But importantly, there were no new safety signals. Patients were allowed to get azole antifungals, strong CYP3A4 inhibitors with appropriate dose reductions. And in terms of grade three QT elevation on study, you can see it was 2.3% quizartinib in 0.7% with placebo. However, there was a difference in 30 and 60 day mortality. And we have to take that into account, especially in the myelosuppression that we will see with any second generation drug that we add to chemotherapy. Cronolinib, gilteritinib, quizartinib, they are all active against wild type FLT3. So we have to expect some myelosuppression. Now, these studies with other second-generation drugs have been done in phase one studies. Here's the data from Keith Pratt's with gilteritinib and chemotherapy in the newly diagnosed FLT3 mutated AML patients. You can see an amazing 90% complete remission rate. Now, again, this is both ITD and TKD mutated patients. What's not shown on the slide, however, is nearly half of those CRs, that CRC, half of those are CRIs, which are defined as incomplete hematologic recovery. And so some of these patients may have had just morphologic leukemia-free states afterwards. And so we're going to have to take that into account. These other drugs, gilteritinib and cronolinib, are being compared head-to-head -head with mitostorin in combination with chemotherapy. These studies started after the approval of mitostorin. So we have an appropriate control arm embedded in that study. The precog study is looking at gilteritinib versus mitostorin in combination with intensive induction consolidation and maintenance. The primary endpoint there is MRD negativity after induction. As I showed you from the quizartinib data, we're hoping that that shows a benefit there, but that's a high bar. You're talking about showing a difference between those two regimens after just two weeks of the FLT3 inhibitor, and the proof of the pudding may be later on. So we'll have to see what that study shows. It finished accrual in November of 2022, so hopefully we'll have that by the end of this year maybe even for ASH. The Hovan uh, study looked at gilteritinib versus mitostorin with induction, consolidation, and maintenance. And the study was written with the primary endpoint of event-free survival. That's been amended partly because the study had to be put on hold because of a signal of neutropenia, which will affect the definition of the events. And so survival is the primary endpoint. There we also have, finally, the cronolinib versus mitostorin study as well.
So coming back to this patient, I, I'm not sure what you'd like me to do about it, but you know, what did I do for this patient? I started her on hydroxyurea before I even could come in in the morning and pontificate about the value of leukapheresis being questionable in any patient with AML. A pharesis catheter was already placed for pharesis, but it didn't work. And so she never got pharesis. Can you transfuse red blood cells? We were told we shouldn't, but she has a hemoglobin of four. And so if you actually look at the literature, you can give some red cell transfusions. You just don't want to get them above 10. And then is a bone marrow biopsy required? I didn't think so. We don't need a baseline there. And I guess we'll leave it to the rest of the discussion, what we actually do for the patient. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Erba. Yeah, so, uh, you know, moving on here, I think we're going to discuss this more, the, the recommendations. Uh, of course, we've already talked about giving flitrin inhibitor plus the intensive chemo, consolidation, transplant, first remission. But I think let's leave that to the end of this section. So actually, just to highlight, I completely agree with Dr. Harry Erba. You know, when you look at it visually, these curves look very similar. But the fact that these were all patients up to 75, 40% were older and they were all ITD, to me, that survival curve by age, when you look at those below 60 and above 60, and that below 60, the hazard ratio is now below 0.70. In the ITD, when you look at the ratify, there is a subset data, actually. It shows the ITD low and ITD high, and both of the hazard ratios are actually close to 0.8 and cross 1. So I think for an ITD young patient, population and also given tolerability with the quizartinib, we are more inclined towards the quizartinib aspect of it. Now, of course, giltritinib versus mito, I think will be a very important comparator. I mean, if that's positive, then yes, that would improve on the current standard of care. But if it's not, then I think we're kind of back to the drawing board to some extent. So now what about maintenance? So you've got the patient through intensive induction, you've got him to remission, you've got him to transplant. What do you do for this patient? He has a known FLT3 mutation. And so most of the data, including two randomized phase two studies that use sorofenib, one was a German study, the other was from China, both have shown actually very similar survival curves, very similar benefit in EFS and OS. This was the study by Burkhardt et al. from the German group. And so based on this data and also many other phase one papers that had been published, we started incorporating maintenance FLT3 inhibitors post-transplant. Now, which is the best? Is it sorofenib, first generation, more toxicity, GVHD risks, liver toxicity, hand and skin? So people were a little nervous about that and we've done it but you have to really be on top of it and adjust dosing. So then of course we said yeah but now you have giltritinib, quizartinib. These are second generation designed as FLT3 inhibitors not mito and sorofenib which were designed for solid tumors and then taken into the FLT3 space and they have less of the GI and skin and GVHD toxicities. So this led to this large phase three study, the Morpho study. This will be shown about a week from now at the EHA meeting, highly recommended for all of you interested in AML to look at this presentation because I think you will realize why we should not depend on press releases to make any decisions. Many of us have seen the data and when you see it, what was called a not positive study, I think you may come away after seeing some of the survival data that the question really is who should get maintenance, not whether maintenance should be given to all or none. You know, in medicine, rarely do we answer questions like that. It's really about who should get it. So the things I would focus on when you see that study are number one, you have to realize that FLT3 is a very dynamic mutation. It can be gained, it can be lost. And at relapse, now we have three different data sets all showing that anywhere between 45 to 70% of patients who receive a FLT3 inhibitor with induction either go to transplant or not and relapse no longer have a FLT3 detectable at relapse. So it could be that if you're giving maintenance to some people who have achieved a very deep remission, there's no FLT3 clone, the FLT3 inhibitor is having very limited benefit. So you really need to know if that FLT3 was present even at a low level to know if the maintenance would benefit. And kind of in the same line, this was data from the Quantum First study that Dr. Erba and others led. This was a subset that was presented at the ASH meeting by Mark Levis, where they showed that if you were MRD negative, this was using a high sensitivity in vivo scribe molecular FLT3 PCR, if you were negative below 10 raised to minus 4, those patients after transplant, the benefit seems limited of quizartinib versus placebo. Those lines are overlapping on the left. However, if you're positive, even at a low level with that FLT3 PCR, then those patients who went to transplant, post-transplant got maintenance, here is the benefit. So this is what you need to focus when you look at the morpho, because I think over time, it's going to become more of a question of how do you select those patients who will benefit from maintenance without having to expose everybody to it? Because of course, any drug post-transplant can create toxicities and issues. So look for some of that data. Here, I want to just kind of give a message out to how HealthTree is also trying to provide education to patients and caregivers, and especially in the FLT3 space. I think there's a lot going on there. But maybe we take a little bit of a discussion here. So to Dr. Erba, when you have a new patient, 
do you routinely send FLIT3? How long does it take to come back? And what do you get back? Is it ITD, anti-KD, allelic ratio, allelic burden? What do you look for? So I think it's clearly an important topic. We need that data quicker than most people can get an NGS panel back. And so we do PCR right at the time of diagnosis. And we get it back within, you know, 72 hours. And when you do PCR, you'll get both the assay for the ITD and the assay for at least some of the TKD mutations, not all of them. That'll come on the NGS panel, but the most common TKD mutation you'll get from the PCR. And so you can, if you have a patient like Susan, you can start her on seven and three, send off that assay, and on day three or day four or day five, get the FLIT3 back and it's positive for FLIT3-ITD, then you can give what I would do hopefully in the next few months is give quizartinib. If they have a TKD, then I think there's a benefit of mitostorin as well. And so we have options for patients. Great. So let me turn it here to Dr. Barate. So, you know, you've participated, you've seen the data. What are your thoughts, newly diagnosed, quizartinib, mitostorin? What would you use for a young, fit, let's say 50-year-old patient coming with new FLIT3-ITD mutation? And what would be the kind of pros and cons you think in, with those two agents? So I think the thing from Dr. Orba's talk that I took away the most, especially in the younger than 60 age group, I mean, we, we saw the, the survival benefit, we saw all of that, but I think Again, I haven't used a lot of quizartinib, but I have used a lot of mitostorin. And what I think still scares me is the toxicity associated with mitostorin in addition to 7 and 3. I think with the GI toxicity, you know, sometimes you can have not just severe nausea, vomiting, but even though we are leukemia doctors and we can tolerate a lot, I think when you see a patient, you know, develop an ileus, go to the ICU and have certain things that you know are related to a medication, I think it's really nice that we have an option with the second generation FLT3 inhibitor that may mitigate some of that toxicity. I think as we, you know, if this is an option for our patients, as we use it more, I'm sure we'll figure out some unique toxicities to quizartinib, QTC being one of them. But I think that I find very appealing for a young, fit, fitly positive patient. Yeah. And I, I think we should highlight that, right? I mean, even though clinically we haven't seen much arrhythmia, we've used it a lot at MD Anderson, even the single agent, higher doses. You have to be careful, right? If It can very easily get a situation if you start giving levofloxacin, right. posaconazole, zofran, and then you give quiz, that may become a clinical issue. So yeah, it's something that is seen, it can be managed, but trying to avoid too many overlapping QTC drugs I think will be important as this goes out into the real world. Let me ask Dr. Fati. So maintenance, what is your approach today in Boston for a FLT3 mutated patient going to transplant? So it's currently not very data-driven. We use a lot of gilteritinib post-transplant in patients who have uh, FLT3 mutations. Pretty much everybody gets gilteritinib. Now we will all see in some fashion the results of the morpho study in a week, 10 days. And you know, I'd love to get a sense of the reaction across the community regarding what that presentation will, will convey and how that will impact how we use FLIT3 inhibition after transplant. That particular trial had, there was some concern around accrual to that study around the time that the Boucher study that I think that was just presented by Dr. Dover was presented and then published because folks were saying, well, you know, it looks like FLIT3 inhibitor therapy after transplant is necessary. It leads to improved survival. So it's very difficult to do a placebo-controlled study where a patient can be randomized to placebo after transplant. So at that time, I think sites either decided that they were going to go stick with sorafenib or do their institutional experience, which in our case was gilteritinib. But that's what we do. And I'm personally comfortable using that agent following transplant. Yeah, that, that's kind of what we do as well. But as you said, we will look at the data and dissect it and discuss it a lot once we see the morpho data in the near future. So let's wait for that. And then with this, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Fatih to go over IDH mutated AML, please. Amir. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here among friends and colleagues, and I appreciate Peerview inviting me to speak about IDH, which is perhaps not quite as uh, apropos of uh, the developments that have happened as FLIT3, but still, I think, quite relevant. Okay. So Harry had his case. I'll have my case. This one, I think, is a little bit more of a standard case rather than one derived from reality, but we'll, we'll go through it. Michael, 74-year-old man, presenting with low platelets have been worsening as well as uh, neutropenia. He has some comorbidity, I suspect fairly substantive comorbidity if it's mentioned here, an ECOG performance status of two. And the baseline testing confirms that he has an IDH1 mutation, he has AML, and his cytogenetics are intermediate. 
So the NCCN guidelines are provided here. This is for patients who are over the age of 18 who are not candidates for intensive therapy. That's either because perhaps due to their age or comorbidity or that their physicians feel that they're not candidates for traditional induction. And the choices that are provided in NCCN really depend obviously on whether you have an IDH1 or an IDH2. But azacitidine and venetoclax is a category one for both. Ivo and azacitidine for IDH1. Decidabine and venetoclax also for both. Ivocidinib for IDH1. And enacidinib is also mentioned for IDH2, although I have to say that is not an FDA-approved indication for anacidinib in the frontline setting. So let's get into it. So the exciting Agile Phase three clinical trial placebo-controlled study of older patients or those actually who are not appropriate for intensive induction chemotherapy or 75 and older, this trial randomized patients to receive either ivocidinib, the IDH1 inhibitor, plus azacitidine versus azacitidine and placebo in patients with IDH1 mutated AML. And folks could be 18 and up, but like I said, it was for induction ineligible patients. And there was a one-to-one double-blind randomization of almost 400 patients with stratification by region and de novo versus secondary AML. And this combination was given in continuous 28-day cycles with the primary endpoint being event-free survival which it met very comfortably. As can be seen on the left, we have the event-free survival curves, which are quite separate from each other, almost a chasm when you think about AML in terms of ivocidinib and azacitidine versus aza and placebo. So obviously addition of ivocidinib decreases the events for these patients. And then overall survival, This also, I think, impressed a lot of us in the field. Here we have an impressive improvement in overall survival with a median overall survival that hovered around 24 months, which was quite remarkable. Now, we have to keep in mind a lot of these patients are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. 24 months, that is, I mean, where I started as a fellow 15 years ago to think that patients in this age group would benefit with a relatively gentle combination regimen is quite remarkable. So obviously, this impressed a lot of folks, not only in the community, but among the regulatory agencies, led to the approval of azacitidine and ivocidinib in the frontline setting for older patients or those ineligible for intensive chemotherapy, in addition to the already present approval of ivocidinib for as monotherapy for relapse refractory and newly diagnosed AML. So this was the original data. Now we have the update. Actually, the update, I think, was also presented relatively earlier today and is also going to be an EHA update as well. I mean, I thought maybe it will settle out. It's, it's even more impressive. Look, median overall survival of 29 months and uh, placebo plus AZA is as we would expect, around eight months. So that's crazy, but pretty impressive. So IVO plus azacitidine in patients with IDH1 mutated AML. So getting into the nitty gritty, the composite remission rates of both arms are provided here. And, you know, there is an improvement in composite remission, 54 versus 16%. There's also other responses that were seen in the combination arm as well. Safety summary. So in terms of cytopenias, to be honest, there wasn't a substantial difference between the arms for ivocidinib and aza versus placebo and aza. The road that I'd like to sort of focus your attention on is the leukocytosis for ivocidinib and aza, although grade three or higher was not present. There are a subset of patients who develop leukocytosis, likely related to development of differentiation syndrome in that subset of patients who develop it with ivocidinib, the IDH1 inhibitor. Bleeding events were more frequent with ivo and aza than with placebo slightly, 41% versus 29%. And then differentiation syndrome, which is a adverse event of interest with IDH inhibitors, both IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors, occurred at 14% with the combination, which is in line with what we've seen with prior trials of IDH inhibitors. And apparently 8% <laughs> also had it with AZA and placebo. Um, there have been reports actually of some differentiation syndrome with HMAs, probably not that high, but nevertheless... So few grade three non-hematologic toxicities. There were some cases of fatigue, pyrexia, and I guess diarrhea, although I have to say diarrhea is probably not a pronounced feature of uh, ivocidinib, maybe more so with HMA, but it may take time for patients to respond, and this is key. We already know that it takes time to respond to IDH inhibitor monotherapy, but also with HMA, although the responses tend to be earlier, some people can take up to three to four months, three to four cycles to response. Hematologic toxicities can be seen as 
is the case with HMA alone, and that is typically seen during the first cycle of therapy. However, there is an improvement in neutrophils and responders pretty soon after the start of therapy, typically within the first few weeks, within the first month. So that is noteworthy in terms of patients that ultimately end up responding. And because there is, as was mentioned with quizartinib, there is a theoretical risk. Well, there is a risk, but not perhaps for prominent cardiac toxicity, but for QT interval, I think we need to be careful about certain concomitant medications. Now, differentiation syndrome, previously described with IDH inhibitors. It's uh, IDH inhibitors, their mechanism of action is related to differentiation and maturation of aberrantly interrupted myeloid precursors. So releasing that block in differentiation can lead to a very over-robust cytokine-mediated process that can lead to a pleomorphic symptomatology that includes high fevers, weight gain, edema, pleural pericardial effusions, infiltrates, renal failure, adenopathy, you name it. And because so many other things can mimic it, oftentimes if we suspect it, we treat with steroids, but also treat the other thing that possibly is being mimicked as well, such as infection or cardiac issues or volume overload. So because if you don't treat differentiation syndrome and you say, oh, this is just, you know, bacteremia or it's an infection or patients just volume overloaded, patients can get into trouble. And patients have died, not necessarily on this clinical trial, but in previous studies and in experience, if uh, differentiation syndrome gets out of hand and patients end up intubated and in the intensive care unit. So it's very important to isolate and detect potential differentiation syndrome because it's very responsive to steroid therapy and oftentimes times occurs concomitantly with leukocytosis and sometimes hyperleukocytosis. All right, so we talked about ivocidinib and azacitidine and its very impressive results to date, including recent results or soon-to-be presented results. But there are other options also for IDH-mutated patients. Here we have the famed results of the Viali A, that's the phase three study that ultimately led to the approval of the combination of venetoclax and azacitidine versus placebo and azacitidine subset analysis on that study has been looked at several times, and populations of patients, particularly IDH-mutated patients and particularly IDH1-mutated patients, tend to do quite well. And that is also a combination that I think is increasingly used and considered in IDH-mutated AML. A recent publication by Dan Pollier and colleagues from Viali A actually looked at the two subsets. Now, this is subset analysis, as you can see the numbers are going to be smaller and the number of events are also quite small. But I think you would agree with me that the curves in general are a little bit different. Suffice it to say that venetoclax and AZA is better than AZA regardless whether you have IDH1 mutation or IDH2. So it seems like it's a good combination for IDH mutated patients. However, for IDH1, here you see if you sort of, you know, look closely at 12 months, you're looking at the median overall survival is hovering around 14, 15 months per se it's much more impressive for IDH2. And it seems patients are continuing to respond and do very well. So we'll see what all this shows, but suffice it to say, this data is out there and people are gaining more and more experience. So let's go back to our dude, Michael, 74 years old, presenting with cytopenias. He's got comorbidities, he's got an IDH1 mutation, and his cytogenetics are intermediate. Is this patient a candidate for IDH inhibitor and ASA or a VEN-based regimen? So at this juncture, and I, you know, actually Dr. Dover and I were discussing this, I think, three, four hours ago. I think this kind of has changed over time, you know, our perspective on this. We were very excited, still super impressive results with then HMA, but the results emerging from IVO and azacitidine are, are quite unique. And I think accepting a scenario where a patient is so proliferative or so unstable where we cannot wait for the IDH mutational status to come back, I would use ivocidinib and azacitidine. And for whatever reason, you know, there is not an available fast turnaround test, I can potentially consider using azoven because I think it's a very good regimen. But otherwise, I think the ivocidinib and aza is probably my personal go-to in that scenario and goes to show you that I think having these results back in a timely manner is very and also increasingly important so that we kind of know what we can offer patients, particularly those who are not induction candidates. I think I already answered the second question. And in each case, what safety plans would need to be in place. So for Ven HMA, I think that's a bigger discussion because of the dose of venetoclax with concomitant medicines, duration of venetoclax and marrow suppression, the timing of the bone marrow biopsy and decisions that follow it. So I think it's a little bit more 
complicated, and I think there is a lot out there regarding each of those topics, all of which are very important and require some degree of expertise and experience. But for ivocytinib and azacitidine, I think two factors are several, so three key factors. One is you should give time for response. Although many people start to respond during the first cycle, some people take longer. Two, concomitant medications can be problematic. So if you're potentially using a concurrent medicine that also has a risk of prolonging QT, you should be thoughtful because ivocytinib can prolong the QT. And thirdly, the risk of differentiation syndrome. And like I said, if you have a patient coming in with fever, pleural effusions, infiltrates, things that you can't explain or potentially could explain, but the timing may make sense with peripheral differentiation, perhaps you should consider the initiation of therapy for DS, such as with steroids. Based on this presentation, the patient is likely a good candidate for ivo aza If more aggressive disease had been present, then AZA would have been a good option also, and obviously what we talked about for that. Good. So here we can kind of open it up a bit to discussion. So what are the thoughts? Maybe I'll start with Dr. Erba. So if you have a newly diagnosed older IDH mutated patient, what are your considerations? aza ivo aza ven Do you differentiate between IDH1 and 2 in selection and prognosis? So it's great to have choices. Yeah. And this is a great example of that because both regimens, Ivo-Aza and Ven-Aza, are benefits for our patients, especially older patients. But the way I choose between them really depends on what my goal is. So if I'm sticking to the labeled indication for either of those regimens, over 75, unfit for you know intensive chemotherapy, not a transplant candidate, I do think that Ivo-Aza would be the way to go. And waiting for that IDH result to come back is important. Now, we do PC. CR and we get it back within 72 hours. But even if you wait for the NGS panel, think about this guy. This guy came to your clinic. He wasn't ready for you to say, you need to be admitted to the hospital and get treatment. And he needs some time to get his affairs in the order. Or even if they come in with cellulitis or if they come in needing a transfusion from your emergency room, you can wait for this data. You can wait for it, except for the very proliferative state. So I would wait for it in that population. And the reason for doing it is partly the median survival of 24, now 29 months compared to what we saw in the LEA. But really, it's the data that's been shown in every in the phase 1B and the phase 3 study where the neutrophils get better in the first cycle. And this is important in terms of patients having fewer numbers of infections, which they saw in the, the Agile trial. And then on top of that, what's important for, is for the future of those patients, because as you know, treating these patients with ACE of N can be very complicated, especially for older patients. You're changing the dose, the sequence, the duration of the venetoclax from cycle to cycle. Here, here, once they get in remission with Ivoaza, it's Ivocyte nib 500 milligrams daily with, you know, your choice of HMA. A lot easier for the patient. So I think it's worth waiting. Finally, on the other side of the coin, if I have somebody who is 72 and I know they have an IDH1 mutation, or I don't know, but I think this patient, once they get in remission, may be a transplant candidate. Azaven gets these patients into a remission quicker. The reason why you don't see a remission quicker with the Ivoaza is not because the count recovery. That can happen more quickly. It's the blast reduction, which takes longer. And you're never going to convince your transplanters to take a patient to transplant if they still have 5% or 10% blast. So it depends on the patient and how they choose between these. But it's great having options for both types of patients that we see. And I think there's another kind of side to the coin, right? I mean, we're again at big academic centers. We get these results quickly. And I think the problem is, you know, when the community doctor emails me and says, I take three weeks, I don't know if I'm that comfortable. It's debatable to wait three weeks for this 9% subset. I think that's where it's a little bit tricky. So now there's data coming out with sequencing. I think that data will be very informative. You know, I think we all, because of the label, tend to think that using Azaven and then saving the back pocket, which is not something I like to say, but let's say using an IDH inhibitor and salvage will be the label way. But recent data that Max Tal and some of the other colleagues have put together actually shows that if you use Azaven up front at relapse, the response rate to IDH inhibitors was actually quite low, about 20%. And in fact, if you use the HMA IDH inhibitor, whether it was in or Ivo at relapse HMA event, you were getting 50% response. So retrospective, small numbers, but I think we need to learn what we intuitively think will be the sequence because of the way they're approved may not eventually be the best way to use them. And then, of course, we're going to talk about neither of these are curing 70, 80%. So can you then combine them? I think the bar is high here, right? With the Azaven, Ivo, or Azaven, Ina, you really will need a few years of follow-up because it's already at 29 months. The three-year survival is 40, 45%. So you would need to see 60, 65% 
meant, but that would be great. Maybe this is a subset like core binding factor that we can now put into the list where we can cure them. So I think we will see in the future. So Uma, in your uh, experience and thought process, how do you approach newly diagnosed older IDH? Are you waiting? Are you starting HMA then? What are you doing? So we have a very similar process that was just described. We get the IDH mutation status back in about 48 to 72 hours. I think we do have the luxury of knowing what the IDH mutation is and then really deciding, as was very elegantly described by both Dr. Urban and Dr. Fati, the more proliferative, sicker patient, you know, we tend to go with Azaven. If you have time, the patient is not as sick. We do tend towards using Azaivo in that situation. You know, there's some Mm -hmm. clues sometimes to the patient with the IDH mutation, right? I mean, in my experience, when I've been waiting for it, it typically is a patient who presents predominantly with neutropenia, and the hemoglobin and platelets may not be that bad yet. Yeah. Typically pancytopenic patients. Yeah, exactly. Especially the platelets. um, I don't know if we published, but yeah, this is something is very commonly seen. You know, platelets above 150. Yeah. You start thinking, that's a great point that Dr. Herba is making about IDH mutation. So you can get clues. Now, hopefully we will, the sequencing, it is getting better. I think every year more and more centers are starting to get it sooner. So hopefully we will get that data and be able to use it in the frontline setting for our patients. So with that, let's see. Okay. So we're going to now move towards the more difficult subsets for which we are still looking at new agents and hoping that there will be breakthroughs and a lot of effort and research is now focused into these populations of older AML with high risk. So I'm going to turn it over here to Dr. Barate to start us off. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm going to focus more in my talk mostly on something that has been brought up by the previous speakers a number of times. We've had the option of using HMA venetoclax now for several years. We're all using it in academic centers and communities. And my talk is really going to be focused on how do we manage using that regimen as effectively as possible for our patients, knowing that we're trying to develop adding other agents such as FLT3 inhibitors, such as IDH inhibitors, such as TP53 directed therapy, which then Dr. Davar will go over. So this is our hypothetical patient that we're considering for discussion here. This is Alice. She's a 75-year-old lady. She has de novo AML. And like a lot of our patients in that age group, she definitely has a declining performance status of two. She has several comorbidities as are listed here. And in terms of the information you have, she has 75% blast. She really doesn't have any targetable mutations, so we're not going to argue about, you know, Aza-Ivo, Aza-Ven, none of that, normal cytogenetics. So in her situation, what would your options be? And if you look at the NCCN guidelines, typically without actionable mutations, you have AZA, you have HMA VEN, but specifically AZA VEN as a category one indication. You obviously have the option of choosing the cytobine. And then you have several other recommended options that we've sort of briefly mentioned, like LODAC VEN, which is not used in the US as much. You also have single agent HMA, which I think, again, is something that we don't use a lot. And then you have other drugs like Glastigib, Gemtuzumab, Ozogamycin, and obviously there's all always supportive, best supportive care if the patient is not eligible for therapy. But as we've discussed, we have a lot of AML drugs available, and so it would be really nice to be able to offer our patients something. So just going back to the updated data on VLEA, this was presented at the last ASH meeting by Pratt's and colleagues, and we can see that with longer follow-up, this time about 43 months, that Venesa continues to have a significant overall survival benefit compared to placebo plus Aza. And we've talked about hazard ratios a lot. Just to remind folks, the hazard reduction here was 0.66 at 75% of this OIS analysis. And the overall hazard ratio was 0.58. But again, as has been discussed extensively at this discussion and many, many other discussions that we all have, one of the limiting factors of how we can effectively use AZA plus VEN in the community and also in you know, the inpatient setting and continue to give patients this therapy are the cytopenias, namely neutropenia and then more importantly, febrile neutropenia where patients get in the hospital, develop you know, infections like pneumonia and so on. These are the cytopenias and infections that really keep your patients from continuing to get the therapy that they need in order to get that survival benefit. So in the VLEA trial, as was as you can see on this slide, that were really the notable grade three and higher events were the febrile neutropenia events, including sepsis. And the TLS, which has been talked about a lot, especially in the CLL setting, was really not as much of a factor in AML. 
So with this, there was a really nice paper by Brian Jonas and colleagues trying to be as practical as possible in how do you dose azavin when you start a patient. And if you look at the label and you look at sort of the recommendations from this paper, what they're telling you is you start, you know, as is recommended, you start both together. The cycle one dosing is 28 days of VIN. And you kind of go through that and you get that first bone marrow biopsy. And it is really, really important to get that first bone marrow biopsy because what you want to determine from that bone marrow biopsy, typically done between day 21 to day 28, is is the patient in a morphological remission? And if the patient is in a morphological remission, you really want to take a step back and you want to see what is going on with the count recovery. And you want to give the patient time before you start that next cycle to recover their counts. And you don't want to sort of power through because we know that this is a potent combination. And if you continue to treat the patient in significant cytopenia, that is not ideal for the patient as we just saw with the complications of febrile neutropenia. So when you pause, you pause up to 14 days, you can use growth factor. And that's when you go on to the next cycle. And that's when you consider dose reductions or dose modifications. So that was this really, really, I think, informative publication by Pratt's and colleagues looking at a post hoc analysis of the LEA and really looking in depth at what happened to patients that were dose reduced after they achieved this first, you know, CR, CRI response. And how did those dose modifications affect the patient's survival sort of in the long term. So as you can see in this slide, you have the 185 patients that were looked at, and then you can see there were a handful of patients that really didn't even have any cytopenias and they weren't really part of this analysis. And then you have some others that had outcomes that were not something that they could continue to follow. But then if you look at the rest of the patients, you look at the 59 patients on the slide, you can see that most of those patients immediately got reduced to 21 days after they had their first sort of post-remission dose reduction. This was dropped to 29 days pretty quickly. And then you have these 71 patients that actually continued with the 28-day dosing, but in a median of three cycles, they also dropped their dose to about 21 days. And then you had a small fraction of patients that actually continued with the 28 dosing for a while. And if you look at the cumulative survival and outcomes of the patients who had their dose dropped to 21 days, whether it was right away after that first cycle or whether it was a little later on in the treatment, they actually didn't really have that much of a difference in outcome. In fact, their overall survival actually was pretty good and continues to be good as when this was presented. So I think the takeaway, which most of you actually guessed pretty accurately, that I see here is it is actually beneficial I think when you treat the patient in your practice to really get that marrow, get that marrow between that day 21 to day 28 and reduce the dose of then if you think you've got the response that you need. So don't sort of power through, be patient, get the marrow, look at what's going on with the patient and then dose reduce the then thoughtfully because overall it really is beneficial to your patient to continue therapy for as long as they can with the appropriate dose of venetoclax. So in general, I would say, you know, for most of us, if we get the IDH mutation or not, Azaven is the standard of care for these newly diagnosed unfit patients. We know now that it's generally well tolerated. It doesn't have an inconsequential mortality. It's still 6 to 7%, so we all have to be mindful of that. There's clearly concerns with prolonged neutropenia, which we want have to mitigate. And having that early bone marrow biopsy and then either dose reduction or dose interruption is really the best strategy to move forward with continuing therapy. And so far, therapy is indefinite in these patients. So going back to Alice, our 75-year-old lady with some comorbidities and a declining performance status, do you think this patient is a classic candidate for Aza Venn? So I'll turn it over to you for more discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Baradi. So maybe we can open it up here and, you know, your thoughts and then Dr. Fatih and Erba. So... HMA Ven versus HMA, you know, we saw this polling, which again, is probably a mishmash of different hospitals and community where 26% are still getting HMA. And I've been in a lot of meetings and other panels where apparently these surveys are continuing to show that. Is this something that you guys have seen? And if it is, what is the kind of patient phenotype? Is it like this ultra rare 90 plus? When have you had to use HMA alone in your newly diagnosed AML? Any of you thoughts? So I think I could envision right off just 
off the cuff, two scenarios in our patient population. One is the patient severely impacted by comorbidity, regardless of age, in whom we think venetoclax combination would potentially lead to marrow suppression that that person could not handle. So I guess that would fit in with a much older patient with maybe, you know, kidney disease or heart disease or can't move. And so, you know, if it were in a situation where I'm actually looking at a patient and borderline considering recommending palliative care or hospice, but there is still some wanting of treatment, I might consider, you know, dose adjusted HMA monotherapy. The other scenarios, which are actually happening quite frequently, well, more frequently than you would expect, are patients who come in sick and end up in the ICU in whom we have to start something and venetoclax is difficult to give. At least we have to get the specific formulation to get it through the NG tube and we don't have that. And we oftentimes start HMA therapy initially and sometimes get to venetoclax at some point in the future and sometimes we don't. I think those are the scenarios that I would potentially think about that we would use HMA monotherapy. I think short of that, I think HMA ven is the go-to for these older, less robust patients. Harry? So I'll take an opposite point. (laughs) <laughs> That's the fun is, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. We've been yeah. agreeing with each other the yeah, entire you're right. evening. Stop agreeing. So I don't think there's a scenario where single agent HMA should be entertained in a patient who truly has AML. So getting back to the patient that you described, I've heard the same thing, right? The patient's too sick to get HMA Ven. I understand that, but does that mean that the patient deserves to get HMA alone? What are you going to accomplish with that HMA? We know that the median time to response is months. We know that the complete remission rate is 20%. And so I get the feeling that you don't think they could tolerate the myelosuppression Depression. On the other hand, I really think we need to make much more difficult decisions earlier on in these patients. We have these options, but I agree with you. You said the word hospice. Not every patient with AML needs to be treated, and they may have multiple comorbidities. They may be performance status four, moribund dementia, other active cancer. I think we have to be better at identifying the patients who we shouldn't even embark on treatment because you know as well as I do, once you give that first dose of azacitidine or decitamine, you're committed to supporting that patient and you've just given them a regimen that's ineffective compared to azaven. So I would argue that you should, if you're going to treat you treat with your best agents and support them through that. Now, the situation that I thought you were going to get to was the patient who's intubated and you can't get venetoclax into the patient because there's no formulation right. or That's no the NG guidance tube. of yeah. giving it down an NG yeah. tube, right? And that does come up. But in those patients, the more common scenario is, well, they're intubated because they have a leukocytosis. So give liquid hydroxyurea, give a single dose, as you guys... Uh, cytarabine of or, cytarabine. or uh, etoposide. Just, Some people do right, that. Yeah, yeah. One single dose. And then let's see how the dust settles, okay? And if they get through that neutropenic infection and they get extubated, then treat them with the best regimen. But I would argue not to start with an HMA. The other scenario I've heard that said is, okay, well, I can start HMA in my clinic, but it's going to take a week to get the prior authorization and the copay assistance for the venetoclax. And so you finally get the venetoclax on day eight, and then you add it in. We don't know if you're adding in anything more than myelosuppression at that point. Yeah, I I think also you have to realize you don't have to give Ven 21 days, right? We didn't talk about it but there's very nice data from the French, Stéphane Botton, doing seven days of HMA events. So I think the scenarios where I have given HMA alone are very, 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 very rare. The one I would actually think about is what we discussed earlier this afternoon, is TP53 mutated, older AML, 78-year-old. Yeah. In our group, you know, among the AML experts, there's a big divide there. The survival is six months flat in both studies. If you're not going to take him to transplant, if you're going to take him to transplant, I agree, HMA event, 55%, CRCR is better, you go for it. But if you have a 77, 78 who really wants treatment, agreed, we can always discuss palliative. That is not unreasonable. Would I prefer to give HMA Ven versus HMA? I think that is a debatable scenario. But then giving less is something I've commonly had to do, right? If I have a, actually, Ravandi, Dr. Ravandi has a 98-year-old patient. Four years in, you've probably heard it because it's quite a cool story. He says it all the time. She's four years in, but she's like on teeny tiny doses by now, like three or five days of HMA event, but she's alive and she's getting it. So if I had to choose, I kind of agree with Dr. Erba here that quick response, right, for a really sick patient <laughs> is kind of what we would do. I always agree with you. I mean, I have to. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, I would say 95%, right, we're using HMA Ven in most scenarios. But it, it, it is an important subject. Let's come back to the French data, right? It's all retrospective. Sure. But what I found really interesting about that is seven and seven, right? Seven of Aza, seven of Venetoclax. And what were the 
they trying to do? They were trying to decrease the toxicity, right? Of course, yep. that's what they're trying to do. They which got the they, same response rate. They, they got the, the same median survival. They got the same toxicity in the first cycle in terms of myelosuppression. Why? Because these are sick marrows to begin with. And so I don't think you have to give 14, 21, 28 days of venetoclax. Right. But I think you need to give some venetoclax with azacitidine. Otherwise, you have venetoclax alone with a 15, 20% response rate, mostly in IDH mutated, and 20% response rate with azacitidine. Put them together. I don't know how to do that, but if you at least give seven days of both, I think the French have said you can get them into remission, but you're still going to have to support them through that Exciting. marrow failure. But, but that being said, with the, I mean, at least we have seen, when you give less ven in that first cycle, it is not that severe the infection risk in most patients with a DAC 10 day. We looked at it. So so if I had to err, I may just go a little bit lower, but it's not going to make it zero you in know. that case. So what about high-risk patients who have the mutations like TP53, MLL? So I'm going to kind of go through some of the emerging drugs, a lot of these coming up. So we have not stopped our research in AML. I think there's a lot more to be done. The biggest group I think that is today unmet need is TP53. Whatever therapy you look at, intensive chemotherapy, HMA alone, decidabine 10 day, HMA ven, we're at kind of six months survival. So APR and CD47 antibodies are kind of the approach we're looking at. This is a kind of the first immunotherapy that looks like it's really moving forward in myeloid malignancies. The way it works is by inhibiting the interaction between the tumor cells and the macrophages, which actually dampens macrophage activity. So it's kind of like the same thing with PD-1, PD-L1, but instead of T cells, here you're blocking the interaction between CD47 and SERP alpha, which actually sends a dampening signal to the macrophages. So by blocking that signal, you unleash the macrophages to attack the tumor cells, in this case, myeloid cells. So this is the data here against in the TP53 mutated AML. This was probably the largest frontline interventional TP53 kind of focused effort with 72 patients enrolled. Majority of these, about 90%, were what we would consider multi-hit or true TP53, bioallelic, whatever you want to call it. And overall response rate, about 50% with the CRA 33%, and duration of response is about eight and a half months. So when you look at the HMA event, it's published by Dan Polier in Clinical Cancer Research in this similar bioallelic high-risk TP53 we see CR rate of about 20% and the CRCRI 40%, duration of about four to five months. So it's not going to be a blockbuster, but hopefully at least a step forward. Now this is being looked at in a randomized study. We hope to have those data actually in the near future. And there are in fact two randomized studies. One is TP53 focus, which I'm kind of more interested in because I think we really need something to move the bar then. And then we can start working on other approaches, cellular therapies, et cetera, to further improve that outcome. So that's the first one, the enhanced two, looking at azamagro versus investigator choice of HMA ven or intensive chemotherapy, because actually many centers, especially XUS, still like to use intensive chemotherapy for TP53. So you can choose either one and the primary endpoint is the survival. And then the other one is actually kind of the viale a study, but with the addition of Magro versus placebo. So all comers older unfit AML to see if the three drug combo will just improve survival across the board and become a new standard. So we have to wait for these data. What about the menin inhibitors? So this is kind of some of the key data that was shown from the menin inhibitors. You know, this is the ziftomenib. This is data that was presented and will be updated by Dr. Fati at the EHA meeting, showing very encouraging response rates with the menin inhibitors. We've already seen publication with the Syndax compound also showing a high response rate. Now it's not high numerically, but these are fourth salvage patients. So the CRCRI, CRCRH rates of 30 to 40% are really quite striking because four years ago, five years ago, fourth salvage men in MLL rearranged patient, we would be sending 90% of them to hospice. So in that population to be able to get 40, 50% response itself, I think quite amazing. And I think once we incorporate these up front, we hope it will be even better. So last few things, I'll just go over some of the new combos. That's an area of big interest that we're kind of focusing on at MD Anderson and all of us now in multi-institutional trials that have started. So this is the doublet of venetoclax giltritinib. We published this at JCO last year. And as you can see, the combination is quite effective at achieving marrow clearance, but we do see myelosuppression. This is something we have seen with many Venn combinations. But again, if you have a patient below 74, 75, your goal is to get that second or third relapsed FLT3 AML into remission and move them to allotransplant. This is a very effective regimen and one we are routinely using for our patients to move them and bridge them into allogenic stem cell transplant. But if you're going to try to do this in an older patient 75 77 you have to really really start de-escalating the venetoclax very quickly in fact even in the first cycle we often start with just 14 days and then if needed use growth factor support
this is just showing that even in these salvage patients with this combo, if you take them to transplant, you can actually achieve good outcomes, which is not something we would have seen five, six years ago in relapsed refractory second and third salvage FLIT3 mutated AML. Of course, then the question is if this doublet is doing well, at least in getting marrow remissions and clearance in the salvage setting, can we move it to the frontline setting and maybe have less myelosuppression, healthier marrow, patients have not been exposed to intensive chemo and relapsed refractory multiple prior therapies. This is the data that was presented by Dr. Short from our group. It's quite hard to argue, 27 patients frontline now enrolled with 100% overall response rate, but even more interesting, the true CR rate, full count recovery, which has been the big concern, but now with optimized dosing, that is the key, 14 days only of both VEN and GIRT, which we had to slowly come down to working with the FDA, we are seeing count recovery is quite good and the OS is looking encouraging, but the follow-up is only one year. So let us wait to get a little bit more follow-up, but people are now asking the question, well, if this data holds up, why should we reserve this for your 75, 78 year old? Can we start moving slowly down the age? And randomized studies are being planned to look at that question of HMA Ven FLIT3 versus intensive chemo FLIT3, which is amazing. I don't think 10 years ago, any of us would have foreseen such a question even, you know, coming up for discussion. I think with these triplets, the key is really reducing venetoclax. I think you have to make space for that third drug. And it's okay because as the French have shown, as we have seen, others have seen, you don't need 21, 28 days of Ven, and that will block the third drug from being added. So now over time, working with the label and FDA, we have now been able to come down to 14 days of Ven and even the FLIT3 inhibitor, we're actually starting to cut that even at 14 days. So the 14-14 approach, maybe like the 7-7, is what is moving forward into a larger multi-center study. And with this approach, 14 days of VEN and 14 days of GILT, now the count recovery is actually pretty good, about 35 days, which is similar to the 33, 34 days that was actually seen in the Viale A with HMA venetoclax. So always takes time, but I think we are now close to a regimen that can be moved into a multicenter study. And this is the multicenter study that is ongoing. Many of us and others are participating to finally optimize this dosing regimen and potentially move it into a regulatory or guideline-based use. And then, of course, randomized studies. What I would be very excited to see is comparing it to intensive chemotherapy. It would be great to not have to use that in the future. Quickly, similar data being generated by Dr. Donardo and uh, Dr. Lakovitz, who is our fellow, who's now at Oregon, showing also the triplet of HMA Ven Ivo is highly effective. Here, I think the bar is higher because the median survival is already now 29 months as compared to FLIT3, where the median survival of HMA Ven is 11 and a half months. So the bar will take longer. We will need more mature data, but the response rates do look very, very encouraging. And then lastly, of course, the TP53 group, similar question, and we may have a little chance to discuss this, is whether HMA alone is sufficient and HMA magro is all you need, or does HMA then still add that response component? Maybe the survival is not that much better in TP53, and should you do the three-drug combo preclinical data suggested by Marina Konopleva that the three-drug combo was effective at promoting more phagocytosis and apoptosis? So we have kind of taken that forward, and in this study, at least, it did look that the response rates were better compared to what we had seen with the triplet, but I think these numbers are quite small, so we have to wait for randomized enhanced three data. And I think this is, again, a good problem to have. Do you need azimag or do you need the triplet going forward? CD123, there's a lot of efforts ongoing with this. One of the lead drugs here is a drug called IMGN632 or Pivecumab. This is actually being developed in the frontline BPDCN space where it is actually currently in a regulatory approval-based protocol, but an AML is also being evaluated in the frontline space in combination with HMA Ven. Similarly here, we are now down to 14 days of VEN, and in fact, the response rates are looking quite good. This was the early data in the salvage setting. We're seeing close to around 45, 50% overall response, but the focus will now move to frontline, and that data will hopefully be at the ASH meeting later this year. So just to close out here, just kind of again highlighting our partner who's been very supportive and is kind of more focused on patient education. This is the Health Tree Team, and now they have a number of different courses and videos. They've done a lot of work in myeloma. I think that's kind of been their base, but they're moving more into the AML, and please go check this out when you have an opportunity. So there's a few interesting questions. Maybe we'll go over a couple of those. So one of those questions is an interesting question. We didn't mention this, but Dr. Kantarjan got the Karnofsky Award. Very, very, very well deserved. And he talked a lot about how, you know, when he started, the cure rate for all leukemias except APL was less than 30%. And that included chronic diseases. Now, almost all of them have moved to 80, 70, 80% ALL, CML, CLL, younger AML. Of course, we still are remaining now with TP53 and others. But he did make a statement, and this is the question 
question, actually. Does the panel agree with Professor Kantarjan's statement in his Karnofsky lecture that venetoclax will become part of standard of care for most, if not all, AML patients? So thoughts on that? Maybe Dr. Borate. I mean, I think it's definitely part of every backbone that we want to add to. I mean, I think it's hard to argue with the VLEA data and the progress in terms of against you know, single agent HMA. And I think that's why you nicely highlighted all the different triplets that we're trying to do. But I do think what you mentioned and what the Pratt's paper showed very elegantly is that we need to find the right dose of Ben. And I think, you know, we've all said that, the data is showing that, and I think moving forward, if we can find the right dose of Ben to combine with HMA, it's a beautiful, extremely potent combination. We want to use it well, we want it to benefit our patients, and then hopefully we want to add more drugs that can target other parts of the patient's disease and get that curve to, you know, be even wider and longer in the future. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think we're now in the phase of kind of optimizing then and, and trying to backtrack down to the needed dose, kind of like the Project Optimist yeah. approach, right? But it's just taking longer. We're going backward a little bit and then seeing how we can, because the other statement that he has made that many of you heard is that the current label and duration of Venn is really becoming a big hindrance to develop the new combination. So now I think finally the FDA and a lot of efforts are moving us back to a level where we give it sufficient to achieve response and then people stay on it for longer, many years, which is kind of the goal of treatment. Let's take uh, maybe a couple of questions. So maybe to Dr. Erba, is the incidence Severity of diarrhea different between FLT3 inhibitors and in early trials of mitostore and GI toxicity side effects were a problem. Yeah, so the interesting thing about the GI toxicity that we all experience, our patients experience with mitostorin, was actually never captured in the ratified trial data. If you look at the publication, the difference between mitostorin and the placebo came down to a higher incidence of rash, anemia, I think there might have been one other thing, but never mentioned GI toxicity. And the reason for that is that that toxicity data came from the induction, where the study drug and placebo are being given at the time of mucositis. So patients either, you you know, most of them, it diluted the number. A lot of patients already had problems from GI toxicity. And what's really important to look at is what is the toxicity of the drug during maintenance? The reason why, you know, I think quizartinib may be a better drug, especially during maintenance compared to mitostorin is number one, quizartinib does have single agent activity. Mitostorin does not. And number two, in the patients that I've treated with quizartinib, I have not seen significant GI toxicity with that drug. Whereas when you're giving mitostorin, patients complain of the smell of it. They have to take ondansetron before each dose, leading to constipation and much more GI toxicity. Yeah, totally. And even, you know, giltritinib, which is a fantastic drug. I mean, the safety profile is great, but we have seen GI issues. I have seen it with giltritinib, especially in post-transplant. Most of them are minor. You can dose reduce to 80, but you're right. From the GI point of view, quizartinib has the least. Now, of course, you have to monitor QT and there are other things, but yeah, GI-wise, I think there's a big gradient. And just quickly to answer that question, somebody else also answered, do we think the GI toxicity is due to hydroxyurea, which most FLT3 mutated patients receive, not as much as FLT3 inhibitors? I don't think so, because as we were discussing, we we see a very different profile with the different FLT3 inhibitors. So maybe let me ask Dr. Fatih one question here. What percentage of older AML patients do you think receive unmodified doses of HMA VEN? For patients requiring VEN dose modification, in which cycle is this commonly happening? And I think they're asking just what is your perception or observation of patients referred to you? What are people doing before they come to the big academic center? Are they giving 28? Are they giving 21? What's happening? I think there is a range. Unfortunately, MDS and AML are relatively uncommon diagnoses in the community who see a lot of solid tumor and lymphomas. So I think gaining of experience and interacting with us as the sort of the cancer center is important because the label simply says 28 days or continue until you do a marrow at the end of the cycle. And, you know, and in my view, and I, I'm preaching to the choir here, I think that's a bit of a overdosing of venetoclax, frankly, because people develop a lot of marrow suppression, get into trouble. And in fact, when the drug was first approved, I think probably all of us saw a lot of patients coming in with big, bad infections, bleeding, complications trips to the ICU, mainly because people were kind of managing it as they were with HMA monotherapy, which is now in hindsight quite dangerous. It's kind of like flying without a pilot because you kind of don't know exactly what's happening in the marrow. So what I generally recommend and what I always try and preach is to do a marrow biopsy around day 21. And if the marrow comes back with uh, hypocellularity and suppression of blasts, which we call ablated, we recommend holding venetoclax and delaying initiation of the next cycle until there is some degree of count recovery. And generally, we hold at least two weeks to accomplish that if we need to, and sometimes longer. Once it gets beyond three to four weeks, I get nervous.
that perhaps things aren't going well and maybe they needed another marrow biopsy. But generally speaking, that's been our approach and we've had success. You know, I'd say the large majority of patients either recover their counts or get into a remission or they don't and they have persistent disease that will reflect itself that cycle or the subsequent cycle or the cycle after that. Yeah, and I think it's nice to see, right, three, four years ago, I think it was a little bit divergent. People were doing different things. I mean, this meeting and even over the last one, one and a half years, almost everybody in the academic who's now had nice exposure and time to use HMA then is doing something very similar. 21, 28, it's fine, but they're stopping after the marrow once you show remission ablation, they're giving time and most of us are then reducing reducing quickly to 21 or 14. So I think there is unanimity and we just now need to work with the FDA and others to I mean, get this. As uh, you were saying approved. earlier, the key is to prime these patients so that they can stay on something for as long as possible and benefit from it. Exactly. That's ultimately what we're trying to do, exactly. not hammer them up front and decrease the duration that they can that they'll get the drug. Yeah. So last couple of questions I'll take quickly. So one is in the magro enhanced study in TP53 fit patients, how do you select patients that go into the IC cohort? It is investigator selection. So they will decide before randomizing the patient if they want to do intensive chemo or low dose. It's going to be very different geographically. In the US, I think many people are going for HMA base, HMA VEN for TP53. Although I've been on many investigator calls and cheering committee and in Europe, that is not the case. They are actually putting 80, 90% of their patients TP53 on intensive chemo chemotherapy, part of it is the label. They cannot use off-label insurance, but I do think we will see a mix of those patients based on geography. And then the last one, in the magro study, unfit looking ahead, do you think the triplet is going to be best option? I don't know. We will update the data at ASH. I do think that the doublet in TP53 is actually looking pretty good. So we will have to wait and see as we get more data coming forward. So with that, thank you so much for all of you joining. This activity is certified by PVI. Peerview Institute for Medical Education. This activity is developed with our educational partner, Health Tree Foundation for Acute Myeloid Leukemia. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.